This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Conflict of Heroes, Storms of Steel, the third edition. Conflict of Heroes, Storms of Steel was released in 2019 by Academy Games and designed by Uwe Eichart and Gunter Eichart. This game supports up to four players and takes from one to four hours to play. In the last episode, we covered two of the five basic actions for Storms of Steel, movement and stalling. In this episode, we will continue with learning attacking, rallying, and playing cards. So let's pick up where we left off with the attack action. Targets can only be acquired within the attacker's firing arc. A unit's firing arc is the front three hexes of its facing. This arc extends outwards diagonally from the adjacent hex on either side. This expanding arc of hexes within a unit's range is known as its fire zone. Any enemy units within this fire zone are all potential targets. To get a better understanding of range, we will concentrate on the line of fire from the center of this Soviet rifle squad's firing arc. The first step in initiating combat is finding a target within the unit's range. A unit's range number is in the bottom center of the counter. This stat is the number of hex spaces that a unit can attempt to hit a target at normal range. A unit's maximum range is double this amount. Range is measured from the center of the attacker's hex to the center of the target hex. The number of hex spaces to the target are then counted, excluding the hex that the attacker occupies. Proximity to the target has an influence on the attack rating. Remember, to score a hit, the target's defense rating minus the attack rating equals the hit number, which the attacking player must meet or beat with a dice roll. A target beyond the attacker's stated range is considered long range, and penalizes them with a negative 2 to their attack rating. A target within the attacker's stated range is at normal range. A target adjacent to the attacker is at short range and grants a plus 3 to their attack rating. And when the target occupies the same hex as the attacker, it is at close range and a plus 4 is added to the attack rating. One exception to close range rules regard crews. Crews are units with groups of 2 to 8 soldiers operating heavy weapons such as machine guns, mortars, and field guns. A crew unit can be identified if their firepower has a white background. These units can easily be overwhelmed by close quarters fighting and as a result receive a negative 2 to their attack rating. Once a target is confirmed to be within the attacker's range, they must then establish Line of Sight, or LOS. Hexes with terrain features that block a unit's ability to see its target also prevents it from attacking. After all, most units can only shoot what they can see. Woods, buildings of any type, corn when it's in season, as well as heavy smoke markers all block Line of Sight. Finally, 3D contours of the land, such as hills and balkas, may also block line of sight based on the position of the units involved. However, other units, whether they be friendly or enemy, do not block line of sight. Be aware that units within terrain that blocks line of sight can still be seen by an attacker as long as they have an unobstructed view to that hex. Any blocking terrain hexes between the attacker and target will block line of sight. Units within terrain that contain features that block line of sight also often provide defense bonuses to that unit. We'll talk about those cover bonuses in a moment. Finally, let's discuss acquiring multiple targets in the same hex. Unlike other war games, Conflict of Heroes does not have a stacking limit for each hex. Players can pile as many units as they like into a single hex. However, be aware that when an attacker targets a hex, they also target all units occupying that hex. For example, if a hex contains three enemy units and an attacker fires into that hex, 
they then get to resolve a separate attack against each unit. As a result, players may want to think twice before bunching up their units in one space. So far, I've presented the most basic combat calculation. A player's defense rating minus the attack rating equals a hit number. The attacker must then roll two six-sided dice to attempt to meet or beat that hit number to score a hit on the target. While this basic calculation will serve players well for several encounters, there are other factors such as terrain cover and proximity that affect the ratings of both sides. These factors are known as defense rating modifiers and attack rating modifiers. Taking a closer look at the target's defense rating, if the target is attacked through its front three hexes, then the player uses the bottom number, the front defense rating. And if the target is attacked through the rear three hexes, the top defense rating is used for flank defense. To be clear, when a target occupies the same hex as the attacker, the flank defense is used. These defense ratings can be further modified by terrain. If the target is occupying a hex that contains a ford or a river, subtract one from the defense rating. If the target is occupying a hex with a wood building, sloping terrain, steep terrain, a small balka or marsh, add one to the defense rating. If occupying a hex with woods or a stone building, add two to the defense rating. The attacking unit also has two ratings, which are used based on the type of target. For soft targets, use the upper red number. For armored targets, use the lower blue number. As we just saw, the attacker's proximity to the target can modify this rating. Once players have accounted for these environmental and range considerations, the attacker knows the true hit number they must meet or beat with two six-sided dice. However, before they roll the dice, they must decide whether they will use command action points to lower the hit number. Up to two command action points can be spent in this fashion. However, this must be done before the attacker rolls their dice to see if they scored a hit. When the dice are rolled, if the result exceeds the hit number by four or more, then a critical hit is scored and the unit is immediately destroyed. And now that we understand how the combat calculation works, let's take a look at the possible outcomes when a unit is hit. When an attacker scores a hit on a target, the affected player draws a random hit marker and places it on their unit. Storms of Steel comes with two sets of hit markers, one set for soft targets with a red backing and one set for armored targets with a blue backing. During setup, players can place these face down and randomize them or stir them up in an opaque bag or cup. Storms of Steel's first two scenarios only use soft target hit markers, so we'll cover them here to prepare you to play. Historically, the psychological impact from a battle can be just as devastating on a unit's ability to fight as the impact of bullets. Therefore, 19 of the 20 hit markers influence a unit's morale, and only one, the destroyed hit marker, will outright eliminate a unit. Be prepared that most units will take two hit markers to eliminate from the game. Each modifier printed on a hit marker applies to the stat in the corresponding location on the unit counter. For example, if a panicked marker is drawn, the unit cannot take an attack action and their firepower is nullified. The unit becomes fearful of what's behind them and their flank defense increases by one, but their front defense decreases by two. Another important rule regarding hit markers is a player's opponent does not know how a unit may be impacted. When a hit marker is drawn, the player owning the unit reviews the result and then places it face down on their unit to conceal the effect from their opponent. That player may always reference their own hit marker at any time during the game. A hit marker is only revealed to the opponent if the unit conducts an attack or a movement that requires a spent check, or if the defense or attack rating is required for a combat calculation. If any of these events come into play, the hit marker is revealed and becomes public information. Otherwise, the player should keep the results of the hit marker secret from their opponent as long as possible. This unit will remain in a panic state until they successfully rally. 
When a unit rallies, it recovers from its battlefield affliction and refocuses on the fight. The required rally number can be found in the top center of the hit marker. Keep in mind though, a rally is prohibited if an enemy unit occupies the same space as the unit with the hit marker. There are also a number of situations that aid a unit in their rally attempt by providing modifiers. Concealing terrain, essentially terrain with cover, lowers the rally requirement by one. And for every friendly unhit unit that occupies the same hex as the unit attempting to rally, reduces their rally requirement by one. Finally, remember that a rally is an action and costs five action points and therefore will require a spent check, plus any applicable action cost modifiers such as stress. Whenever a unit is eliminated, it is placed on that side's command action point track. The first destroyed unit is placed on the starting cap number specified by the mission, the second destroyed unit on the next lower cap space, and so on. This represents the loss and attrition of frontline leaders that affect a force's command structure, cohesion, and combat effectiveness. As a result, the more units a side loses in the battle, the less of an influence command has on the battlefield, measured in the reduction of available command action points for each round. Also be aware that when destroyed units are placed on the command action point track, the number of caps is impacted immediately. Whether a player has used their caps or not, once a destroyed unit is placed, the cap marker is reduced and that player immediately loses any of these caps. However, a player will always have a minimum of three caps in the game. Once destroyed units reduce the cap marker to the three space, any additional losses do not affect their caps. Therefore, a player will always have at least three caps to work with at the beginning of each round. There are three types of cards in Storms of Steel. Battle cards, veteran cards, and weapon cards. Battle cards allow a player to execute special and unexpected actions. They are always discarded when played. Veteran cards give specific units extra capabilities. They are not discarded. Weapon cards enable explosives, artillery, and airplanes. Their use is dictated by the mission. The first two missions in the game only use battle cards. Battle cards are often drawn at the beginning of a round, there is no limit to the number a player may hold in their hand, and unplayed cards can be held until future rounds. Let's walk through the basic layout of a card to understand how they work. A card's title is shown at the top of the card. In the upper left hand corner is the card type icon. There are four card types. Action types may be played as a player's action during their turn. With bonus types, any number may be played in a turn and are not themselves actions. Artillery types are used to coordinate artillery strikes. Mission types determine mission objectives or initiate a mission scoring, event, or ending. Below this is the action cost to use the card. Cards may require action points or command action points. Several cards do not cost anything to use. The lower section of the card details its effect. And the lower left hand corner has the ID number that is often referenced in missions. The bottom of the card may have one or more battle icons. There are three types of battle icons. The groups icon indicates that the card may be played as part of a group action. High explosive or HE icon is a reminder to resolve an attack against the target's flank defense. Finally, the question mark icon indicates that the card can be used with a hidden unit. Keep these rules in mind when using cards in your games.
Once players have exhausted all their units, or both passed, it's time to proceed to the next round. When this occurs, it's a good idea to run through the pre-round sequence checklist. In the first step, advance the round marker to the next space. Second, remove all light smoke markers from the board. And third, flip heavy smoke markers to their light smoke side. The first two missions do not have smoke, so you can skip these steps in your first few games. Fourth, flip all spent units to their fresh side. Fifth, reset caps. Six, draw battle cards. Seven, prepare reinforcement units. Remember, you can find any reinforcements for that round on the round track. Eight. Plan the next round's off-board artillery strikes, and 9. Resolve the last round's artillery strikes. The first two missions do not have artillery, so you can skip these steps for your first few games. And finally, step 10. Roll for initiative to see who goes first. The side that is not leading with victory points rolls two six-sided dice. They may modify this roll by spending two caps. The initiative check succeeds on a roll of 7 or higher, and if successful, that player takes the first turn. If the roll fails, their opponent takes the first turn. This tutorial takes us to page 18 in the rulebook. With the rules we've covered here, you should be ready to play Mission 1, The Courier Satchel, and Mission 2, Twilight's Last Gleam. In the next episode of this series, we will begin learning the advanced rules for this game. For now, enjoy these two missions, and then catch up with me later to learn more. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.